All right, everyone. Good. Good. That was fast. All right, how's everyone doing? Good? Yeah, week two going okay? Yeah. Anyone, anything interesting happened this week? Anything yet? No? I saw you two days ago. Okay, a uh, quick note. Birthday Whose birthday? Alex. Want to sing happy birthday? <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Alex. Happy birthday to you. And did you bring everyone cookies? Like I did? You didn't bring everyone cookies? That's the rule. I brought cookies on my birthday. Oh, it had the first day of class. Remember? It was like a couple days before. And you didn't even sing for me, you guys. Are lame. Okay. Uh, a quick note. Um, a quick note. Actually, there's a meeting of the Federal Society. It's a student group on campus. I'm giving brief remarks. We had uh, heard about the Supreme Court and Obamacare. Or something. I'm not sure what. So if you were free right after this class at 12 tw uh, at 12:20, there'll be some free food, and you can give me a talk for another 20 or 30 minutes if you are so inclined. Uh, if you're not, I understand, and you can uh, uh, just ignore the uh, invitation to hear me speak even longer. Okay, which I know is tempting. Okay. Uh, any questions on what we covered last class? I know I raced and rushed to the end. That's probably the most difficult class of the semester to teach because there's so much on such a wide variety of topics. But I want to thank you because you all did a very good job. Uh, it wasn't an easy class. I think you handled it very maturely, and I, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, so does anyone have any lingering questions from the Pearson v. Post case, or the Splunky and Explorers case, or anything like that? Anything lingering in your minds? Okay, keep that. It'll stay in the back of your minds, and it'll come up from time to time in the semester, and I'll make a point. Uh, unfortunately, the seating chart, which you all filled out, is not quite ready yet, and I didn't even get a copy of it back, so I'm going to have to ask you to say your names one more time. I promise it'll be the last time. Uh, I, would, I was hoping to have it today, but it, it wasn't finished, so I will have to, unfortunately, ask you to say your names again. Okay? So today, today we are going to be doing two topics which are kind of related, but, but not really. The first is the application of the rule of capture with respect to not animals, but some other type of natural resource, oil and gas and water and other natural elements. Um, we'll discuss at some length of how judges, when they were first confronted with the idea of, well, who owns this oil well, looked to the common law and said, well, we have these precedents about hunting foxes, and we have all these cases about hunting whales. Damn it, a fox like oil. Well, well, we'll get to that in a minute, and there are both pros and cons to that. Um, the important part for you to recognize is actually Texas has adopted the rule of capture, and this will be on your bar exam. Uh, you will take a separate class on oil and gas, so I'm sure I will know all the things you want to know about this, but this will provide a nice um, entry. Uh, the second part of the class discusses a different topic. Instead of acquiring property through capturing something, we're going to talk about acquiring property through creating something. Right, so this isn't pulling a fox out of nature and making it your, your pet or your dinner or whatever you want to do with it. This is about using your mind and your body to take resources from the world, put them together, and create a product. Maybe it's an idea. Maybe it's a story. Maybe it's a poem. Maybe it's a song. Maybe it's a picture. Whatever it is, you are able to use your own intellect to create something. Actually, uh, uh, this might be a funny place to start. Uh, did anyone think recently there was a story about a, a monkey who took a selfie? Okay, so this is actually a good story, right? There was actually uh, a guy doing um, an investigation in a, you know, some sort of exploration in the jungle. And a monkey, here's a picture of it, a monkey stole his camera. The monkey stole his camera. And of course, what would any monkey do? He took a selfie, right? I didn't, he didn't know what he was doing, but you know, he was you know, clicking around, right? Cl clicking. OK. So it creates a very interesting issue, right? Who owns that photograph? Oh. Because usually, right, if I were to take a picture of all of you, my act of clicking the shutter on my phone, right, or whatever, I would actually have copyrights to that image. Who owns <laughs> the copyright when the monkey takes a selfie? <laughs> well, it's actually a fairly difficult question. Um, the 
Monkey, of course, has no say in this because we know who he is and he's long gone. And fortunately, monkeys haven't hired lawyers yet, but wait, that might be the next opportunity for employment. Uh, but the, the, the better question is, does the photographer own it? And recently, the U.S. Copyright uh, Office said the photo cannot belong to the photographer. Why? Because he didn't press the button. The monkey actually stole his camera, <laughs> took some pictures, and threw it down on the ground. So this makes this question, right? What does it mean to acquire a property right in an item? How do we create you know, a photograph? Is it good enough to hand a camera to a monkey, let him do it for you? Of course not. We actually have to do it ourselves. And with a photo, it's you know, fairly easy. You go and you hit click, right? Or as it were, click, like this in an iPhone. Or perhaps you have a, uh, an artist who draws a picture. Okay? So this is actually an interesting place to start. But you've probably seen this picture around. This picture belongs to all of us. Because the monkey has a copyright, and because a copyright can only belong to a human, this copyright cannot be enforced. So everyone owns this. So you can actually go into Wikipedia and download this picture for free, and there's no problem with it. In fact, the photographer tried to actually sue Wikipedia to say, take it down, this is my photograph. And they said, screw you, this is, <laughs> it's the monkey's photograph. <laughs> so it's a funny place to start. Anyway, so any questions about the monkey, the monkey selfie? <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty good picture, too. I don't think I can take that good, but yeah. yeah. So if I go on vacation and I ask somebody to take a picture of uh -huh. the people I'm with, uh -huh. and they take that picture and then give me the camera back, it's... The well, presumptively, photo. you hired him as your agent to take your photograph. Ah, right? So I'm sure the photographer took that picture. He was working with some company. So really, it was the company above him that was asserting the copyright. So if you give someone your camera and say, hey, take a picture of me, you're, that's not your agent, if you want to put it in legal speak, right? The monkey was not the agent. That he stole it. There was no agency. There's maybe bananas. Stuff was bananas, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go over it. <laughs> Oh, there it is. Is that the same? If somebody steals your camera, takes pics, like steals it, takes pictures, police catch on, you get your camera back. He owns all the pictures. Um, pictures. probably he would be a stop from claiming it because he was using stolen property. Although generally, monkeys aren't subject to the laws of theft. Generally not. Anyone else? Yeah. One last question. Go for it. Could you argue uh, acquisition by creation as in eBay? Ah, okay. So, I mean, he put on, put in all the work. He brought the camera to the jungle, did all these right. things, right? So, you would actually argue that he has some percentage claim to that photograph, right? Okay. So we'll 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 come to this later, but for a preview, just because you buy the paint, that you buy the canvas, and you buy the brush, and you set it up on an easel, right? And then someone comes and paints on it. You don't own that paint, right? Someone else did that. Perhaps they used your equipment, and maybe you could sue them for using your equipment. But the actual creation was made by this monkey. <laughs> it's silly, but it's a, it's a good way of thinking about it. All right, all right. No more questions on monkeys. Let's go about. It. Let's go back to foxes. Um, so the, I know, right? He has very good teeth. Uh, it's it's such a good picture too. It's like the perfect angle. I, I, I couldn't take such a good picture if I tried. <laughs> anyway, we should go track down the monkey and give him his royalty check or something. All right, anyway. So let's go back to the role of capture, right? We discussed that, generally speaking, despite the Pearson Post dissent, the majority rule has been for almost 200 years to acquire a wild animal, to acquire some wild beast. The way to get occupancy or possession is through capture, okay? And what does capture mean? You have to physically kill it, or physically wound it, or put it in some sort of trap or net, or throw a stone at it and, and, and wound it mortally. But you need to have some sort of physical contact, right? Right. And the reason why this rule of capture evolves is for a couple of reasons we discussed, one of which is it's easy to apply. It's a certain rule. We know the person who actually caught the fox because he has a fox there. Also, it's very uh, 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 much of a way to um, ensure that we don't have these ongoing evidentiary disputes in class. I'm sorry, in court, right? Because he says, well, I chased it for this many hours, and he chased it for this many hours. Easy. Whoever gets it gets to keep it, okay? But the downside to this rule of capture is that it's often not fair. I think, I think uh, was that Mario? Uh, Mario alluded to it. Like, so you have the hunter who comes and spends all this time 
putting his effort into this hunt, right? And what does he have to show for it? Zero. <coughs> Sorry, that's kind of the labor theory. The labor theory never actually caught on with respect to capturing stuff. So we have this rule of capture. Okay. So why is this rule of capture helpful beyond hunting animals? Well, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, in most states, in Texas for one, judges look to the rule of capture to discuss minerals and resources. And it's kind of like a, an odd analogy, if you will, right? How, how is oil, how is oil like a fox, right? How is, how, how is coal or natural gas like a whale? All right, let's start there. Sir, in the pink, what's your name? Jason. Jason, tell me, how is, how is oil like a fox or how is oil like a whale? What, what, where, where's the, where's the connect comparison? Because under your land, it can move and shift. Uh -huh. like, like, say, I'm a property owner and you own the property next to me. Uh -huh. The oil that started out under my property did not move under your Ah, okay, good. So that's kind of like, just like a wild animal might move back and forth from property, but the oil or gas could be the same. Okay, exactly. So a lot of the early common law judges, right, said, you know what, in a lot of respects, the same way that a fox might run from one part of the property to the other, oil might travel underneath the ground from one part to the other. Same for gas. You know, gas, it, I don't know if any, of you, any of you have experience with this, but the earth has many layers, right? many geology wrestling, right? The earth has many layers, and different layers have different thicknesses or densities. And when you have very deep ground, the, 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 the land may be very porous or, or not very dense. And it's actually possible for oil and gas to kind of spill and slosh through the different parts of the land. So even though your property line might end here, imagine, and you have a pool of oil underneath your land, it might seep into your neighbor's property, right? So how do we deal with the situation where you have some oil under your land or some gas under your land, and then it starts spilling into your neighbor's property? Well, the judge said, you know what? Let's treat it as if it were a fox, right? Let's treat it as if it were a whale. Okay, so ma'am, what's your name? Sonia. Okay, so let's let's talk about animals for a second. So say you have some foxes on your property, right? And they're, they're your foxes, like you're, you're, you're a farmer. And then the foxes run and they hop over the fence, right? And they go to your neighbor's property. Ah, why not? Yes. Okay, very good, right? This is this doctrine, uh, which we said, rationing solely. Remember we talked about this last time? If there's some wild animal, or if you want to use the fancy Latin, very naturae, right? If there's some wild animal that's on your soil, that's what rationing solely means, or on your land, right? It's yours. But as Sonia said correctly, if that wild animal escapes, a fugitive fox, if you will, right? If that wild animal escapes and goes into someone else's land, it ain't yours anymore. It's not yours. Okay, so if we treat then oil like a fox, sly as a fox, if you have a pool underneath your ground and then it sloshes through to the next property, now it belongs to the person whose house is underneath. Okay? But let's try a different example. Um, what's your name again? Elizabeth. Let's think, think back to the duck case, right? So you have one guy who had all the duck hunting in his property, and then you had some jerk who was standing on his own property and then would fire a gun and try and scare away the ducks, right? Mm -hmm. What did what, what the court say there? Good, okay. So let's, let's use a similar example. Um, what's your name? Ava. Okay, so Ava, let's do a simple example. Say you have a pool of oil underneath your land, and then Elizabeth, instead of shooting at your ducks, sticks a drill like this on an angle, slant, if you will, and she starts sucking oil from your land, right? How would that come out under the duck case, the people case? Um, well, it would allow the well, think about it this way. Are you using resources on your own land? You are. Are you? you well, it's under their land, but it's on your land. No, no, no. The oil pool, imagine, is right here where, the, where this spigot ends, right? 
your, your properties here. So what you do is you kind of drill at an angle like that. So compare it again to the ducks. Remember, in the, the duck case, you had one guy with all this, these ducks on his land. Some other guy fires a rifle on his own property to try and interfere with the other guy's business, right? Do you see the comparison? Explain it. Walk. Talk it through. What's, what's, what's the analogy? That you, it's like you're. You're yeah, you're on the right track. Yeah, keep going. You're interfering with their. Um, you're not going out. It's going out of their rights to interfere with. Yes, you're interfering with their property rights, right? In the same sense that you had the jerk with his rifle, shooting you know into the sky to scare up the ducks. Here, you're trying to interfere with someone else's resources, right? The property is under Elizabeth's land. The land's there. That's where the oil is, right over here, right where the spigot ends. And you are, instead of firing a rifle across the border, drilling on an angle, right? And you are, effectively, what's your name? Jake. Jake, what are you doing to your land? What's that, what's that work called? Trespass. trespass, right? You are literally committing a trespass. Your property line, it's not in the picture, but imagine your property line's right here. Your tube sticks underneath her property. And we say, this is a maxim in the law, you own all the land from your property underneath down to hell and up to the clouds. Right? I'm not exaggerating. This is, this is Latin expression I won't bore you with, but it says a common law, you own everything underneath your property and everything up to the sky. Now, that became difficult when airplanes were invented. And there were actually a lot of early common law cases, which you might have studied in torts, people said, uh-uh, you're violating my air rights. You're flying over my land. And so the common law backed away from that when one man got wings. But uh, you own everything going straight down. I saw a hand there. Yeah, I was just going to ask that when, when there is that separation of property, but there is a natural, but it's legal if they drill on their property in the reserve. I'm getting that. to that in five minutes, yes. <laughs> I'm almost there, but working out their way, okay? Right? So you own all the property in your land. And you might not realize this, but when you sell your house, right, to someone else, like the whole three of you who have houses, maybe, you're not just selling the land. You're actually selling the stuff underneath, the mineral reserves, and the air rights. Does anyone have any experience with this? In, in the, okay. Yeah, we're here. Uh, my mom told me about the air rights when a big crane was uh -huh. doing construction next door to her house. Uh -huh. And so if the crane was over her uh -huh. house too much, I think people complained. And so now the crane had to, like, at special times, yeah. maybe go over the house, but not too much. Yeah. Well, what about when you, like, say you buy a ranch? Uh -huh. Don't you have to also buy the mineral rights? Yes. What, what so if someone else can own the mineral rights. Yes. Like, yes, exactly. Is that you raise your hand for? Okay. How does that work with you own your property? Own because you can sell it. So here's what's interesting. You can keep what's called surface rights, right? You can keep your surface rights for your houses, and then you can sell to someone else your mineral rights. So it's very possible if any of you have land out in the country or wherever, you might own what's above, but you don't own what's below. That's kind of an odd thought, right? And so when you sell your house, right, the person you're selling it to isn't actually buying everything up to sky and down to hell. They're only buying the surface rights. You can also lease your mineral rights to someone else, which means you basically retain an ownership and they pay you, it's not exactly a lease, they pay you royalties, they pay you a cut of, of it. Uh, so, so in Texas and just about everywhere, when you're buying a piece of property, you should be aware that maybe the thing you're buying is not the mineral rights. And it's often the case that you have speculators come in and they think, oh yeah, let me buy your uh, your mineral rights, and then they find something. They make a bajillion dollars from it. That's our hand somewhere there. Yes. You'll study deeds next semester in detail, but generally speaking, yes. In the deed, it'll specify what are you specifying, or what are you selling? Are you selling the surface rights, air rights, or mineral rights? And those can be separate. They can be separate uh, uh, aspects. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so everyone, everyone with me so far. So at an abstract level, the rule of capture kind of makes sense. I mean, if you're an 1800 judge, right? 
if someone is, uh, if, if, if a fox or oil runs out of your property to your neighbor, now it's your neighbor's property. If your neighbor reaches across, commits a trespass, and takes stuff from your land, that's a trespass. That's illegal. Okay? Everyone with me so far? Okay. So one of the interesting elements, though, about oil, and um, what's your name again? Eric. Eric alluded to it, is that oil isn't fixed, right? It moves. So even if you drill here, the way pumps work, maybe someone can explain more, is it puts a lot of pressure in the ground, and it sucks in all the gases and oils from the surrounding areas. And even though you might have your pump here, the pressure might be so strong that it can actually suck oil from acres away. Okay? And I'll show you a really good video to explain this. You ever see this movie? There Will Be Blood? The I Will Drink Your Milkshake? Okay. It's loud. You can't hear it. I'll explain in a second. Abraham Lincoln was an oil speculator also. So um, the way drilling works, and you'll do this much more in a different class, is you have these deep, deep wells, and you have these pipey things, and you know they put a lot of pressure on the ground, and it sucks everything in. So this is like the drinking your milkshake. Even, say the property line was right here, right? Everyone see my finger? The property line was right next to the pipe. So you would not be committing a trespass. But if you put your milkshake straw right right on the line of where the property line is, you can actually suck in oil from the adjacent property. Everyone get that? So even if you're not committing a trespass, it's still possible to suck in someone else's oil. Right? Actually, every year in the exam, someone writes about drinking milkshakes. It happens every, <laughs> every year. At least one person puts it. So I'm sure someone will do it this year. But the act of sucking in the oil can bring in from elsewhere. And that creates a problem, right, from the rule of capture mentality because you're not committing a trespass, right? That's like sitting at someone's uh, uh, border and saying, come here, fox, come here, come here, and, you know, and, and nudging the fox across your border, right? Did you just commit a tort? Probably not. You know, were you annoying? Maybe. So the, the law has had to develop a lot of ways of, of, of dealing with this. Uh, uh, most famous was, if anyone remembers, Mr. Burns on The Simpsons, uh, the episode where, remember, Mr. Burns was shot, and um, they discovered uh, oil underneath the elementary school. So, of course, Mr. Burns puts a slant at like a 45-degree angle going right into the oil pool, okay? Uh, but the courts developed a number of doctrines, so let me, let's walk through this case law a little bit. There's not, there's not much. There's like three paragraphs on it, so we can walk through a little bit leisurely, if, if you will. Okay. Uh, all right, so where was up to? Uh, so what's your name? Andrew. Andrew, okay, Andrew. Uh, let's let's take a look at the, 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 the first one, right? Okay. So it describes a situation where we have uh, uh, two parties, right? A and B, and there's oil underneath A's land, okay? And then we come down to this question here, letter A. And it says, uh, what happens if there's a shared pool, okay, under A and B, okay? B starts draining that shared pool. His own, right? It's a shared pool underneath both of their lands. What do you think happens there? Okay. Generally speaking, the answer is yes. He's right. If there's a shared pool, so let's go back to our diagram, right? Let's assume that this entire layer here 
is oil. There's everywhere. If there's a shared pool on your two pieces of land, then both are allowed to drill there. Okay? Answer what you do? Philip. Philip, what's the downside of this kind of rule where both parties are able to drill on the same pool of oil? Any value that the other party had in this initial property rights? How come? Now the oil is gone. Why is it gone? Where did it go? Well, B is extracting the oil, and there's nothing left for A to take. Ah, what, what does this remind you of that we've done so far? We've done a couple cases. Which, which one does this remind you of? <laughs> well, good, good. Um, <laughs> Steve, what else does this remind you of? Well, we had three classes, so you had a limited uh, 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 session. What do you think? We did it in, in the uh, in the very first class. Oh, the whale thing? No, that was the second class. Oh, that was the second. <laughs> oh, the, the land, the Indians? Yes, the Indians. <laughs> what was the deal with the Indians? Basically, they were there. I'm thinking of the other Indian case. The other Indian case? Yeah. Hey, what's your name? Samantha. Samantha, what was the other Indian thing we did? It was a very similar thing we did here. Uh, well, the one, the Indian case where the, uh, they sold the land from the No. But I, I don't remember Facebook, but um, the study on yes. property rights, so like when they were hunting for yes. things. Yes. Remember they were hunting for the furs? Ah, keep, keep going. Yeah, they branded the trees to do This is, like, you cannot hunt um, foxes in this area. Good. For, um, for the purposes of trading, so you can do it for yourself. Good. We have this expression, right? The tragedy of the commons. What happens when you have two Indian tribes both hunting in the same area? They have every incentive to kill as many as they can. Right? Why am I going to let this other guy kill them? I'm going to do it. So, so when he said there'll be no oil left, I think he was exactly right. Both parties will race to drink each other's milkshake because every drop you leave behind is something else that your neighbor can get. Everyone see that? This is a tragedy of the commons. You have a situation where everyone is being a race. It's also sometimes called a race to the bottom, which is actually uh, apt here because you're basically racing to the bottom of the well, right? There's a, set number, there's a set number of barrels of oil there, and you're racing to who can extract the most first. And that's not a very good way of dealing with the oil oil. If you dry it out too quickly, it'll be dead. You can use it slowly, develop it, you know, inject gas into it, different ways of making it work better. Okay? So the courts actually develop doctrines when this happens. Um, if you go back here, uh, this Kentucky case, Right here it says, you can get an injunction against excessive drilling. So the courts have actually imposed doctrine saying if two people happen to share a well, right, share a well underneath their properties, then courts can make sure that's used in some sort of, you know, equitable manner. But this is very difficult because it is actually to go to court. Now, if you got, have a guy like in the movie we just saw, there'll be a race to the bottom and they'll just suck it out and that'll be it. Done. All right. Everyone, everyone get it with that. So having this shared pool is a tragedy of the commons, and it's not very efficient. All right. Uh, now what's your name? Shelly. Shelly. Read uh, Libby B, please. Okay. Um, suppose B's well starts on her land but angles down such that it bottoms underneath the land and by A. Does the rule of capture still apply? Okay, stop there. Okay. What do you think? So we have a situation where... The, the well angles, right? So it starts on B's land, but then it finishes, or bottoms, if you will, under A's land. Can A drill there? No. Why not? Well, let's look, let's look at this picture again, okay? This is actually the picture I was thinking of, right? The well starts here, but it finishes onto A's land. If A drills straight down on his own property, is he committing a trespass? Straight down on his own property? Yeah. No. Okay. 
if the well is underneath both their property, A drills straight down, this is like the question we did before, there's no trespass. And the rule of capture won't apply. I won't see that. This is the same question as A, basically the same question asked differently. As long as you're drilling straight down on your own property, you're not committing a trespass, you're good. All right? But if you start drilling on a slant, then you're committing a trespass. And if you commit a trespass, that's not good. Okay? Everyone got that? All right. So I'm not going to talk about reinjecting gas. Uh, it's, it's more complicated than you need. But in case you're curious, this case, Railroad Commissioner versus Mansell, that's actually Johnny Football's uh, family. Um, and actually, if, if you Google them, they were actually quite bad. Uh, and they made a lot of their money, right? Uh, they made a lot of their money by basically screwing people. Eh, at least one person left, right? And at least I start. So, um, oh. so they, they make a lot of their money by actually, there it is, there it is. Some of their Aggies in the room. So, so the Mansell family made a lot of their money by basically reinjecting gas to other people's places and taking it out. They were quite unscrupulous uh, uh, business owners, okay? But don't worry about reinjection, but if you want, uh, I actually found a link to an article about the Mandel family in football, uh, and it wasn't, it, it wa wasn't very flattering. Um, I'll, I'll let you just see the headline. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so you, 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 it's linked, and you, you can read that article later at, at, your, um, <laughs> at your leisure, okay? All right, any, any other questions about oil and gas? Uh, you'll take an entire course on this later in your law school career, so don't think you need to know all now. This is just a taste for you. Okay, anything else you want to know about? Okay, let's go on to water. So water, actually, is considered in a very similar fashion to a natural resource like a fox. And um, very similarly, water doesn't really stay in one place. It flows, it comes up, it goes down, whatever. So the early rules discussing water, at least in England, were that you own whatever water is on your land. Right? If there was water on your land, a lake or a stream or a creek or whatever, it was yours. And you had the absolute right to use it. Okay? Um, the American rule uh, uh, became slightly different. And what's your name? Amanda. Amanda, what was the American rule with respect to water? Um, that it has to be a reasonable use. Good. And that waste will make it not a Okay, good. So the American rule was effectively a modified rule of capture, if you will. If you get there first, or it's on your land, it's yours, but you can't use it in a way that's that's wasteful or reckless. Right? You can't just, I don't know, I don't know how to define it, but you have to use it in some sort of reasonable manner. It generally meant that you can't, like, starve your neighbor of water, but that's up to a court to decide. So this was generally the, um, the rule in the eastern states of the Union where water is abundant. Um, if you get there first, it's yours, uh, but you have to use it reasonably. The, the western states adopted a somewhat modified rule. And what's your name? Carrie. Carrie, that's right. Carrie, what is, what is the western states? And I, I think Texas falls under this rubric as well. Um, pretty much saying that if you actually capture it and use it for a reasonable and beneficial purpose, like you have more of a right to it compared to Yes, the right, okay. So in the western states, Texas, Arizona, whatever, it's, it's a pretty much straight-up rule of capture, right? You get there first, you're the first in time, it's yours. And this was designed as an incentive for people to get water and, 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 and find it and discover it. Um, this makes a lot more sense. The, by the time legal doctrine developed in the East, settling there for a long time. In the West, it was a frontier. People were discovering it, and they wanted a legal doctrine that could reflect the fact that people were finding new stuff, <laughs> and they can keep it. Also, it's a lot more arid out there. Okay. That's all you need to know about water. Uh, you may never look at this ever again. Um, you might once see the word riparian. Riparian refers to water law. You may never see that again. And in case you want some more Latin, someone, Mr. John Quincy Adams, found the expression, uh, 
quis es salam, quis es esqui ad coelum et ad inferos. The part you need to remember, ad coela means to the sky, right? Ad inferos is to hell, like inferno, right? So basically means you own the land up to the clouds, up to the sky, down to hell. Okay? So lawyers have a special occupancy in the, uh, in the lower level. Something like that. Ah, uh, there it is. Okay. Any questions on oil, gas, water, stuff like that? Hmm? What was that? Okay. All right. Then let's move on to talk about acquisition by creation. Okay. So I told you that with respect to the rule of capture, my friend John Locke lost out. The entire idea of labor theory and putting effort into creating... Uh, you know, into hunting the fox and chasing him and getting the hounds and the dogs, that theory did not win the day. But with respect to intellectual property, what we might call acquisition by creating something, John Locke is doing pretty good. Why? With respect to the ownership of things and ideas you create, the law rewards labor. The law rewards effort. The law rewards intelligence, ingenuity, creativity. Right? We're trying to reward science, useful arts, creating novel things. Okay? And we'll talk later about how Congress has approached this with a few doctrines, uh, copyright, uh, patent, trademark. Uh, uh, I'll give you a, a you know a semi-brief introduction to these doctrines uh, uh, later in the class, but the Congress has actually taken efforts to protect certain expressions or ideas. The first case we'll do though, and this this is not made clear in the case, and I wish they would make this more clear, is that we're not dealing with any copyrights. We're not dealing with any trademarks or patents. What the court's effectively doing is looking at this in case we're stealing news, right? The same way the judge looked at people stealing foxes. What is the best doctrine, right? How should courts protect property? Right? So what I want to make clear about this INS case is it's not a copyright case or a trademark case or a patent case. They were basically ruling on first principles. They may as well have cited Locke and Barbarak and Grotius for all they care. Okay? This was a very basic case. Who has a property right in the news? Can anyone have a property right in the news? So before I start... I'm sure a lot of you perhaps have blogs, or you put stuff on Facebook, or you tweet articles, right? I'm sure at some point some of you have quoted some article you read or quoted some blog post you read. And I wonder if any of you ever considered, can I do this? Can I copy someone else's article and put it on my own blog or put it on my own um, uh, Facebook page? That's effectively what's at issue in this case. In this case, you had the Associated Press who wrote these articles. They developed this labor. They had staff. They had reporters who made these news articles. And then someone else came and ripped them off. Can you do that? All right. All right any questions before we get started in the case? All right. What's your name? Emily. Emily. All right. Walk us through. What, what are the facts? What happened in this case? Of, uh, International News Service versus Associated Press. This is kind of confusing. What I think is happening mm -hmm. is um, Associated Press had like, gathered news, uh -huh. and they were well. They initially sued uh, INS for finding ways to take. Uh -huh. news. And they're on two different sides of the country, so I think what was really an issue was Associated Press was over like in New York, uh -huh. and gathered news. They were about to distribute, I guess, newspapers. INS found ways to get that news and then distribute it first on the other side. Okay, that's close. Okay. So the opinion itself was written by 
probably one of the least significant justices of the 20th century. Uh, yeah, I've tried. I couldn't find anything else he's done. I looked at This is Justice Pitney. Uh, his, his greatest accomplishment, if you check his Wikipedia page, is that he was uh, Christopher Reeves' great-grandfather, Superman. That's it. That's all I could find. So he's pretty insignificant. Uh, so he wrote this opinion, which wasn't very good and was almost certainly wrong. I'll explain why it's wrong in a few minutes. But the case involved journalism in the early 20th century. And many of you probably named William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, right? You, I, I hope you've heard their names, right? And they, they were very prominent, called yellow journalists. They were very much in the business of writing these sensationalist news stories and effectively trying to push the United States into war. Uh, so, for example, the Spanish-American War was began after the sinking of the Maine. And these yellow journalist papers said, remember the Maine, and they were saying, we need a war, we need a war. Okay, then we fought a war with Spain. Like that. People don't even remember that bit. We fought a war with Spain, that's why we got Puerto Rico, that's why we got Guantanamo Bay. Okay, whatever. History. Um, these newspapers also, though, were able to take advantage of new technologies, which are telephones and telegraphs, where for the first time ever, we had a transatlantic cable. Okay? We were actually able to send stories from the front in Europe during World War I across the pond into the East Coast. Okay? Now, as it happened, only the Associated Press had access to these international reporters. Right? Um, the book says that the INS was barred from, uh, from Europe during World War I because he offended the British and the French because he sided with the Germans. So, so the case says that actually uh, <laughs> uh, William Randolph Hearst was in, was in favor of the Germans. So as you might imagine, the Europeans did not let them send reporters there. Okay? So the AP was the only group that was able to establish this network of reporters, pay for these expensive cables across the Atlantic. All right? Okay, so the way it works is they would have a story in Europe, they would cable it over, send it across the wire, and it would show up in probably New York. Okay? The, the INS came up with three ways, three creative ways, to try to pilfer or use the stories without paying for them. Okay? Uh, the first one was they tried to bribe the employees of the newspaper to give them the stories. So they would effectively go and bribe the people to say, hey, give us the advanced copies so we can print it ourselves. Okay? They also tried to uh, make members of the Associated Press give them news even before publication, which was in violation of their employment contracts. Okay? The first two were not concerned about so much. right? Bribery and violating corporate bylaws, those are what we call crimes, or at least white-collar crimes. You can't do that. The more interesting one was the final method that they try to fame stories. So, sir, what's your name? Michael. Michael, what's the third and most salient for our purposes method that INS used to try and get these stories? We were copying news from bulletin boards and from earlier editions. Good. Okay, so you remember you always seen the movies, you have the little news going, extra, extra, read all about it, right? And then you see people like crowding around the newsroom looking at the boards. There was a point in time, my friends, before the internet. And the way news was actually posted was the newspapers first thing in the morning, would put up the sheets on the walls, on the offices outside their building, right? And that would be how you got the news. You know, during, like, presidential election or a, or, or a baseball game, they would actually write on a board, here's the score, right? Here, here, here's the latest uh, uh, returns from the presidential election. There was, no, there was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. You couldn't check this up in real time. So INS said, oh, I got an idea. I'm just going to send my little boy, my paper boy, right, down to the the AP office, I'm going to copy the headlines off the board, I'm going to run right, back to my office, and then I'm going to cable my office in California. I'm going to cable my office in, in, in Dallas. I'm going to cable my office in Chicago that are a couple time zones back. And that way we can get our morning edition out in time with these stories. Or they just bought a copy of the damn paper and they, they cable their offices on the West Coast. And as, I, as, as the opinion says, due to the fact that the speed of light on these cables moves faster than the rotation of the Earth, right, the West Coast papers would have the stories you know, early enough. Okay? As a funny note, if any of you read after the case, this apparently never happened. Uh, if, <laughs> this apparently was a total myth. Uh, uh, the Associated Press made this up because they wanted a test case. Right? What's, what's a test case, sir? What's your name? Dylan, Dylan what, what's a test case? What does that mean? 
Okay, exactly right. The AP had just invested a lot of money into this telegraph network. You know, this was in the middle of World War I, or shortly thereafter. They wanted a court to say, your work is protected. They wanted a court to say, this is going to be protected. And so they sued INS, but they could have sued anyone. And as that note notes after the case, INS apparently never even did this. They, they bribed people, but they found that more efficient than having a, news, a newsman, a newspaper boy, scribbling headlines off the wall. Okay? Uh, sir, Oh, Jonathan. Uh, Joey? Jonathan. Jonathan, why? Why was it so important for the uh, Associated Press to get this ruling on the books? Why did they want this ruling? Why was this really important to them? What do you think? What would happen, let me ask you this question, Jonathan. What would happen if the court ruled the other way? What happens if the court ruled in favor of the INS that they could copy the headlines? What would that mean? Good. Okay, good. The reason why this case was so important to the Associated Press was they needed to secure their property rights. If the INS and other companies could just rip off their headlines, right, AP would lose business. Now, uh, is there a team? No. Calvin, do you think it's true that if INS could copy their headlines, that AP would lose all their business? They wouldn't lose all their business because they have their certain customers and INS have their... Uh, what, what advantage would the AP have? They still have the rights to the cable. What? No, but even as far as the news, what? What? what even if you have these old newsboys scribbling off the walls, what advantage do the AP still have? Apparently, they were the larger company. Even more so. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, what, 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 uh huh. So, but what advantage AP retain? If 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 they didn't. Win? Yeah, say, say they lost. Say even the AP lost the case. What advantage does the AP still have? Good. First. Okay, so here's the deal. Even, even if the INS won the case, AP will still have the news first. This entire process of sending the newsboys down to the board and copying articles and then scribbling out new articles in a quick, you know, a short amount of time, that's not very efficient, right? Even if they were able to send a story out to the West Coast, the AP could send it hours earlier. So it's not the case, as the AP lawyers would argue, that they'll lose all their business. They might lose, they'll lose some, right? They'll lose something, but if you are a newspaper and you want the headlines first and you want them correct, not subject to the errors of some little boy scribbling headlines off the, off the wall, right? You're probably going to pay for the AP. Now, Lou said something correct. You said it's a natural monopoly. What, what does that mean? Or, or, I'm sorry, you said it. What does that mean, natural monopoly? What does that mean? Ah, yes. No one else had reporters in Europe, right? No one else had reporters there. So even if the court ruled against the Associated Press, they still had the reporters on the ground. They still, threw, they still had the action first. They still had the news a couple hours earlier. Okay? But the AP wanted it all. They wanted a true monopoly. They wanted, if you will, a monopoly on the news. Now, what's this word, what's this word monopoly? I know we've all played the board game. Uh, uh, Ma'am, what's your name? What's your name? No, Alex. Alex, what, what's this monopoly? What does that word mean? Well, I just understand it. Okay, right. So I don't know if you'll ever take a class in antitrust. I don't think a Squibbon has one. But, but generally speaking, monopoly refers to market competition where you have such a solid grip on the market that there's no meaningful competition. The Associated Press probably was a monopoly. Uh, by the way, it wasn't actually just one company. It, it was like Associated Presses. And there were different groups of reporters who pooled together to, to, to make this huge company. Uh, but at the time, they were the only reporters who had this. The court's decision in favor of the AP effectively created a monopoly and solidified it. Okay? But this wasn't like a monopoly with oil 
or the railroad, right? It's not that they were claiming, you know, one, one company owns all the railroads in a country or one, one company owns all the oil production. They were claiming a monopoly on something different. Maria, what were they claiming a monopoly on? What, 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 what was their business? Was it oil? Was it, was it, was it railroads? News. Yeah. What is news? Mm -hmm. Ah, so like, you know, yesterday, you know, there was a car accident on 59. It got stuck for a very long time, right? Was that news? Oh, no. Uh -huh. Let's distinguish, right? The car accident happened, right? And I just told you about it. Which is the news? What about the event itself? Okay, so so th th this this is the issue, right? The actual car accident in '59, right? It happened. Does anyone own that, Maria? Okay, but I just told you. I said there was a bad car accident. There was a wreck. I got stuck in traffic for an hour, right? I just told you the story. What did I just give you? News. Okay. I was there. I witnessed this traffic jam. And I just told a story. I could have written it down just the same. So according to the AP, what they're protecting is not the actual event that happened in Europe, right? The event that happened in Europe is news. It belongs to everyone. What they're protecting is the reporter writing a story about it, right? If there was some battle in France or whatever, that happened. But... If I'm a reporter and I say, here's what happened, here was the battle, here's how people died, here's what the movement was, I have just now created, right? I've taken stuff from nature, I've used my labor, I've discussed it, I've explained it, I put it into context, and I wrote it up. That is what they're claiming was protected. Okay? Everyone see that? Yes, ma'am. Sure, call whatever you want. Their work product, their output, their story, their article. What do you want to call it? Well, like, um, I was just thinking, like, it's almost like they put the labor and they captured it. Kind of, that's how I was. I mean, ah, I was well, they, they, they probably, hopefully they weren't captured in the front uh, in the war, but yes. Okay, so, but now let's look at a subsidiary issue. Okay, fine. They, th that work product is theirs, right? That's their article. Okay. Floor, right? Floor, what happens once they publish that article? Ah, so once they publish it, they put it on the wall, and other people come and copy it. Ooh. Um, I was saying yes, because uh, it's like... Everybody needs to know these things. So we're not only looking at their rights, but we're looking at the people's rights. Okay. Okay, so she so Flora may have made an interesting point. Okay, so she said uh, once it's published, right, this now belongs to the world. These are important events happening in Europe in the war, and people should have a uh, an interest in seeing what happens, right? So James sir? Matthew, how do you think the Associated Press would respond to Flora's argument? No. No, why, why no? Because you don't make any money that way. Ah, why don't you make any money that way? You just post it on the wall, and everyone's just going to copy it. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so. Okay, so then don't post it on a wall. No one will copy it then. And you still making money. Why not? No one's going to see it. Ah, okay, so here's the rub. When you create something, the only way for you to make money is for other people to see it. Right? Duh. If you write an article and you keep it in your pocket, I promise you no one will copy it. But no one will see it. No one will buy it. But the flip side to that is once you publish it and you make it known to the world, people learn about it. And they can copy it. But let's let's not get to the copying the headlines verbatim. Let's let's take another story. Uh, Ma'am, what's your name? Jordan. Jordan. So let's say instead of uh, copying it, you're walking down the street, you see they post this bolt on the wall, and then you tell your friend, hey, did you see that battle in Europe yesterday? You start talking about the article. Do you think Associated Press would object to that? No. Why not? Because they're posting it on the wall, but they 
consumption. And the fact that you're talking about it isn't really like purchasing it. Okay, so now now instead of you talking about your friend, let's come back to your 2014, you email your friend about it. Any problem there? Okay, so now you put on your blog and you quote the first three sentences of the article verbatim. Uh, I, I guess it kind of came down to copyright. Uh, there's no copyright. There's no copyright. So don't, don't go to copyright. What are we talking? I'm asking you. You tell your friend, you don't have a problem with that. Okay, you email your friend, you said no problem with that. Now, on my personal blog, I, put, I just quote the first three par first three sentences of the article. Yeah, I guess I would be a problem with them, like, say, it's Oh, I, I admit it. I say where it came from. Okay, so say instead of publishing the first three sentences of the article in blog, I publish the entire article in blog, word for word, verbatim. If you quote, do it strong, then you know. No. Okay. Now, saying says my instead of it being my blog, Jordan, I make a school newspaper and I start selling this. And I put the entire text verbatim. So, yep, here's an article from the Associated Press, and I quote the entire damn thing and start selling the school newspaper. <laughs> what do you think then? Um, I think if you don't give them like stop because you're making a profit. Ah. Uh, okay. So you have to give them money. Okay. So, so here's the issue, my friends. Right? Here's the issue. When you make something public. You make it public because you expect people to use it. You expect people to talk about it. You expect people to write about it. You hope people discuss it because that makes your product more uh, uh, more engaged, more viral, if you will, to use the lingo for, uh, today. But you don't want people to talk about it too much, right? You don't want people to quote it too much because then they're taking away your interest in, in, in the property rights and the, the, the thing. Right? So the court's opinion in the INS case approaches this in a somewhat weird way. Okay? So, uh, ma'am, what's your name? Rachel, does the court have any problem with, you know, two people on the street, one buys a newspaper and they start talking about the article? Does any problem with that? So what's the beef in this case? Where where does the court find find the, the main problem? Well, because the AP and INS are competitors in business. Good. Okay. So the court's opinion is limited to the fact that these two companies are competitors. This isn't about Josh buying a copy of the newspaper and talking to Rachel about That's not what this case is about. It's about two parties. The entire case is only about the rights that each party owes to the other. Everyone see that? And the court basically admits that it would be unreasonable to make AP keep their stuff secret, right? The true way of protecting their stories would be to keep them secret, write the article, and then lock them in a drawer somewhere. That's stupid, right? No one wants to do that. So the court admits, yes, they have to publish their stories. But just because they publish their stories does not mean that anyone else can commercially use it for profit, right? The court discusses that the cost of gathering news is very expensive, and that this is not something that can be done uh, 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 with little effort. Okay. Simply because they publish their stories and put them on the bulletin board, they're not giving up their property rights. They're retaining their rights to the news. Okay. So in reality. This is really a, a more, it's more of a case of unfair competition than intellectual property, right? Which is what maybe you probably got into the case. It's not really a, a property decision. This is about fairness, right? Okay. So, uh, ba -ba -ba, uh, Eric. So let's let's go back to Pearson v. Post, right? Who does the court rule for here? Hunter or the jerk? Um, let's think about it in terms of the foxes. Who's who's the jerk and who's the hunter in this case? Uh, Pearson's the hunter, uh, Post the jerk. Let's talk about AP and INS. Which one's which one's the jerk here? If it's INS. Why is INS the jerk? Because they're the one taking the information and reusing yes. it as their own. Everyone see this, right? And I think you alluded to it before. The hunter is the Associated Press. They are gathering the news, right? They are putting all the resources into the, getting the story. And then this SOB at the last minute swoops in and takes the story off the bulletin board and sends it to his newspaper on the West Coast to get it first. Right? So here, 
unlike Pearson v. Post, the hunter wins. Right? Who's the answer? Carson. Carson. In Pearson v. Post, the hunter lost. How come here the hunter wins, the AP wins? What? What? Policy reason wise, right? We talk about policy. Why is the court ruling in favor of the hunter, not the jerk here? Kind of goes back to the idea of labor theory because they, they ah. put in so much work to create the news. Good. Right. So remember, I told you with cap animals, my friend John Locke, labor theory, he lost. Right. The rule of capture applies for actually getting stuff, but creation, creating ideas, creating news stories, right? This is where John Locke labor theory is actually prevailed. And the labor theory wins out here. The AP, which put all this effort and labor into printing these stories, putting reporters on the battle lines and dodging the trenches and the tear gas and all this other stuff, right? Okay, we're going to reward that. Even though the other people just swooped in at the last minute. Okay. All right, everyone see this. Everyone get this. This is a case that's grounded in labor theory, that the person who puts the labor into the product gets to keep it. Yes, sir? Check your um, bond example. So, 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 okay, if you want action of the details, there's something called fair use on copyright. And generally, Generally speaking, you can use a certain amount of some copyrighted material, and you're okay. What that amount is, is very much in dispute. Is it a paragraph? Is it two paragraphs? On my own blog, I try not to quote more than two paragraphs at a time. That's my limit. I've heard a lot of people say that, but it's really, there's no set rule. Uh, with music, maybe you can do a 10, 15 second clip of a song. It, it, it really varies. Yes, sir. Is it relevant when looking at these two cases that the fox hunter was doing it for pleasure, whereas the news agency was in the business of doing such? Well, the and court, that's how they yeah, the court thinks so, so very much so. They said that they're they're both competitors in the business. It's not like two fox hunters doing it leisurely. But had he, the fox hunter, been in the business? Of well, 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 actually, if you think about it, if you go back to the Pearson case, the jerk was a farmer. That was his business. His business was getting rid of the the, the creatures of eating his chickens. Sure. Does he actually would profit from this? But do you think there would be additional consideration had the hunter been Maybe. in the business? Maybe. So think, think about health? think about the duck case, right? Right. The, what he was in the business of hunting ducks. It was his hobby, but the court treated just like a business. Remember, they said it's his profession, it's his hobby. It doesn't really matter what it is. So I don't think it really makes much of a difference. Good questions. Okay. Everyone get this? All right, so let me explain to you why this case is entirely wrong. Um, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's true. So <laughs> it, it's entirely wrong. Well, I'll explain why. So the Constitution, if any of you have your constitutions out, um, in Article 1, uh, Section 8, right? Article 1, Section 8, you're you in Kotlin now, right? Article 1, Section 8 is all the powers the Constitution vests to Congress. Congress. And one of which is, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts, okay? Congress has the power to protect intellectual property. To promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. The Constitution gives Congress the power, Congress, the power to protect intellectual property. It does not give the power to the courts. Ah. So I assume you all did a case called Erie Railroad versus Tompkins. Remember Erie? You probably burned it out of your memory. But one of the, trying, right? One of the issues in Erie was federal common law. Remember that? Can the courts create federal common law? And Justice Brandeis, Brandeis said, no, you cannot. The courts cannot create federal common law. This is especially true when there are statutes on the book. Congress had copyright statutes. Congress provided for protecting of work. Okay. Had the Associated Press wanted to copyright their articles, they could have. Why didn't they? Because it took too much time. They published a new newspaper every day, and it wasn't practicable for them to copyright all their stories. Now, that's a problem. But is it a problem for the courts to resolve? Or is that a problem for Congress? 
to resolve? The answer is 100% Congress. 100% for Congress to decide. Okay. So the opinion was entirely wrong um, to this ground. It's no surprise that Justice Brandeis, who also authored Erie Railroad, also authored the dissent in this case. Okay. And he basically said, listen, the creation of these new rights is not for the courts to decide. It's for Congress. We're not, this is not our job. Okay? And as a funny footnote, um, they mention a case in the notes afterwards called Cheney Brothers versus Doris Silk Corporation, which for some reason they used to put a nice extra in your book, but they cut it out, which I'm not crazy about. Um, and this, this case involved a situation where you had someone who manufactured silk scars, right? And every season they would make these new beautiful silk scars, right? you know, different designs, whatever, right? And it was impossible to know which ones would become popular, so they never bothered copywriting any of the designs. Okay? So what, what, what always happens with fashion, when one person makes a nice fashion and catches on, everyone knocks it off, right? Like Teresa Romer. Everyone, everyone gets, you know, a, a fake goods, all the real ones. Okay? And basically the people who uh, failed to copyright their scars went to court and said, hey, you know what? They're copying our designs. INS versus AP. INS versus AP, right? They can't copy my things. I put the labor into investing it. <laughs> so do you all know about Judge Learned Hand? Do the hand formula in torts? He was probably one of the greatest judges to never serve in the Supreme Court. Um, this is him. By the way, do you know what his real first name is? Billings. Billings Learned Hand. Can you imagine what kind of head case you have to be to ask people to call you learned when that's not even your first name? Anyway, very, very uh, uh, interesting judge. But I think it was Billings Learned Hand. Um, it's funny, his, his cousin was also on the Second Circuit in New York. His name was Augustus, or Gus Hand. So uh, the, the old joke was, his, his other brother was a much better judge. So he said, you know what, quote learned, but cite Gus. Because learned had all these you know, flowery explanations, and Gus had a much better law. But Judge Hand basically said, even though he's on the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court was wrong. He basically said, they couldn't have possibly meant to create this new property right of whole cloth. So I'm going to limit that case to news stories. So you have a court of appeals judge saying that the Supreme Court decision is limited only to news cases involving articles, does not apply to fashion or anything else. So he basically overruled the Supreme Court. <laughs> and you want to know what? The Supreme Court did not even grant certiorari to review that case because they knew he was right. So that's generally the rule. So the ISVAP case, it's basically limited to this doctrine called hot news. And it doesn't really apply anywhere else. It's a good case to study because it exemplifies how courts uh, can consider uh, labor theory and creation, but it's not exactly the correct statement of the law. Okay? So in other words, unless Congress intervenes, courts can't make up IP doctrine. That, that's, <laughs> that's the general takeaway. Yes, ma'am? Just to clarify, it was never overturned. No, it was never overturned, but Judge Hand effectively did. Judge Hand basically said they couldn't have possibly meant what they said, so we're going to read this case very narrowly. Okay? So usually when a judge has so much chutzpah, he gets reversed by the Supreme Court. They didn't even touch it. So I think they admitted he was, uh, he was probably right. Yeah, they used to give a nice excerpt of this book in the old edition, but they cut it out. I don't, I don't know why. I want to talk about other things. Okay. All right, questions? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you could cite it in the context of news. <laughs> it, this is one of those weird cases where the Supreme Court was wrong and everyone knows it, and no one bothers citing this case. There are those cases where they mess up. What? It hasn't been extended because no other courts extended it. Basically, it's limited only to the context of news. The Supreme Court makes mistakes, right? There's a great, a great quote. It's, you know, they're not final because they're correct. They're final because they're final, right? They are the last ones, and for better or worse, they get it wrong sometimes, or a lot of times, as you'll probably find on con law. We don't do many Supreme Court cases in this class, which actually is a little refreshing. Uh, <laughs> that way it's a lot easier to criticize the opinions. Okay. Any other questions on this case? All right, let's talk a little bit about IP. Um, and uh, I encourage some of you, if you're interested, to take an IP class at some point, um, particularly if you have any background in science or engineering. 
Um, there's an entire area of law which is well suited to people with scientific backgrounds, which is called intellectual property law, which is mostly involving patents. So there's something called the patent bar. You know, in addition, in addition to the Texas bar, you have something called the patent bar. And this, this makes you eligible to work for the patent office to do patents. Um, in order to take this, you need to have a very specific undergraduate degree. Uh, and you can look it up online, but you need to have science, hard science, or engineering. Usually computer science might not even cut it. IT won't. So if you have a scientific background, some sort of hard science engineering, you might want to consider this is a possible path because it differentiates you from your colleagues. Okay? And this is one other, one other avenue that you might actually find a job you like and something that you have a background in. Okay? So there are three main areas where Congress has stepped in to uh, protect property rights. Uh, copyright, patent, and trademark. And I'll walk you through each of these. Okay? But generally speaking, each of these protections is the government granting a limited monopoly some period of time. If you're granted a patent or a copyright or a trademark, you can now exclude people from using your idea by the force of law. Right? If a newspaper patents, I'm sorry, if a newspaper copyrights something and I try and copy it, they can take me to court and seek damages. The purpose of these protections of intellectual property, and by intellectual property, I mean property of the mind, right? Property of your intellect, property that you create. <laughs> Protecting intellectual property gives monopolies. Okay? It's meant to encourage inventors to create. Because like we discussed before, if you don't protect the IP, there will be less incentive to create new things. This is a very disputed argument, and not everyone agrees with it. Some people say that even without IP, people would still create. I'll leave that debate aside for the moment. But the general theory is the more we protect IP, the more people will be in incentives to create. Okay? The downside, though, to IP, and there's a downside, is it limits expression. Right? If I want to speak or I want to talk about a news story or if I want to discuss something, if I want to sing a song or if I want to maybe do a remix of a song, I now have to worry about paying someone for the information. So IP actually stifles expression. There was actually a case uh, in the last month or two. You know the song? Happy bird. Oh, perfect. We sang it to Alex right now. I think we could have actually broken the law because I think RCA or some record company actually asserted a copyright to the happy birthday song. That, what? What was it like if you're singing it in a, like a, I mean, I've read something about it. I'm streaming online. We just broke the law, my friend. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but a court actually found that no one actually has a copyright to the happy birthday song. So you are all free to wish Alex a, a happy, happy birthday, many, many more. But you can imagine that these kinds of laws can actually restrict our expression. We can't sing well wishes to our friend Alex. Okay, so there are there are a series of downsides to this. So let's talk first about copyright. Okay, I'll do a little bit more lecturing than usual here because uh, this is not particularly uh, uh, sailing to property, but you'll have it for your back. So copyright is meant to protect um, ideas. Okay, but specifically these are ideas in books, articles, music. Artistic works, fabrics, okay? These are protecting the ideas that people have, the ideas themselves, okay? And there are four uh, requirements that have to be met to assert a copyright. And this is very, very basic. It's much more complicated. So the first one is what's called originality, okay? What's originality? You have to have some degree of creativity, right? I have to be able to imagine something that's novel, right? You know, for example, say I write, uh, you know, I, uh, I copy verbatim a Harry Potter book. I say, here, here's my book. I'll call it Harry Potter. Okay. That's not creative. You've just copied verbatim someone else's work. Now, if I create like a parody, like, like you know, Harry Pothead, which is actually a funny story, right? Okay, now I've made something new. All right. The second element has to actually constitute some sort of work of authorship. 
What does that mean? Your idea has to actually take some kind of form. And there are eight kinds of forms that are created, and you don't need to remember these. Uh, it could be a literary work, a musical work, a song, a dramatic work, pantomimes and choreographic work. It's like a stage presentation. Uh, pictorial graphics, sculptural works, motion pictures, audiovisual works, sound recordings, architectural works. Basically, any type of means to express an idea works. It's pretty broad. Okay? But the key is it actually has to be expressed somehow. Right? The third requirement is what's called fixation. What does that mean? It has to be fixed in some sort of tangible form. You know, on a printed page, on a CD, on a videotape, on a record, whatever. All right. Okay. So those are the three. I think I might say four. There are three. Those are the three main things that have to be present. Yes, ma'am. So if, if you choreograph a dance and then dance it, but there's no. Well, that's fixed. It doesn't have to be recorded. That's we fix. The act of actually dancing it out, and I'm sure maybe you can write some description of it, that is what's fixed. Okay. Right. The copyrights existed before movie cameras did, right? There were copyrights before they were before an iPhone to record everything. So try and think about it in those terms. Actually dancing it out, that, that's the performance. Right? Um, one interesting thing, though, about the length of copyrights, and this is one of the more controversial aspects, it's a really long time. And we have Sonny Bono to blame for this. Uh, so everyone knows Sonny Bono is Cher's, Cher's husband. He went to Congress. And he passed this law in 1970-something called the Sonny Bono Copyright Reauthorization Act. And what it basically means is any copyright that came into being after 1978, right? So if I record a song today, the copyright is good for my entire life plus 70 years. So say I create something today, I lift it for another 70 years, hopefully, and then plus 70 years. You cannot use my copyright for 140 years from today. That's a really long time. Okay? If the copyright came to existence before 1978, uh, probably by this point, most copyrights have expired. And once the copyright expires, you have something that's called in the general domain or the public domain. And when something's in the public domain, you can use it at free will. For example, monkey, right? Let's go back to the monkey. Who actually took the picture? The monkey. Can the monkey hold the copyright? No. So who gets the copyright? The public domain, the general domain. Anyway, everyone gets it. So I could put this beautiful monkey with his little smile on a t-shirt, on a poster, whatever I want. In fact, a lot of people as a protest made this or profile picture as a, or maybe my friends at least, <laughs> made this a profile picture after it happened as a, mark, as a mark of protest against a photographer. Okay? All right, any questions on copyright? Just a copyright after 1978, my life plus 70? Yes, sir. Right, so if the copyright comes into being in the year 2010 and the person dies in the year 2011, the copyright won't come out till 2081. <coughs> so, so, I mean, there's a serious risk. And the, the Happy Birthday song, fortunately, fell into the public domain. But you can imagine if RCA starts charging a licensing fee at every birthday party, that would be a very bad thing. Okay. The next form of property I want to discuss is something called a patent. Okay. So while copyright is meant to protect them from expression, right, a book, a movie, a, a drawing, or whatever, Patent is meant to protect uh, something more theoretical, okay? And there are five requirements, right? So what's eligible for patentability? It has to be a process, machine, manufacture, or composition. What does that mean? Instead of it just being an expression of creativity, you actually have to develop some sort of 
novel way of doing something, a novel idea. You come up with a new process or idea. You make a new machine that can create things, a new manufacturing process, or you take two different things and you combine them in a way that no one's ever done it before. Right? This is not putting words together on a page. That will be copyright. Here you're putting ideas together and making something new. Okay. The, the second element for patents is what's often called novelty. It's got to be new. Not just original, new, meaning no one's done it before. Okay? How do you know something's been done before? Well, that's why I have something called a patent office. When someone wants to file for a patent, they send an application to the patent office with very detailed designs. Okay, here's my invention, right? Here's how it works. Also, here's why it's new. Let me list all the prior inventions, which are called prior art. See what people have done before. You go through the patent office's archives and say, no one's ever done this before. Only if you prove to the satisfaction of the patent board that something is novel, do you get your patent. Now, most of the time, it's perhaps an improvement on something that's already been done, which is fine. But it's also been something novel or something uh, uh, has not been preceded in its identical form. Okay. The, the third element is an important one, which is called utility. This has to benefit people. It has to benefit humankind. There has to be some sort of use or utility from this invention, right? Most things have some purpose, otherwise you wouldn't bother trying to patent it. You want a commercial application, people want to be able to use it, whatever. Okay. The most important one is the fourth one, which is called non-obviousness. Okay. What's non-obviousness? Did you actually use some creativity to come up with this? Or is what you're doing really obvious? Right? Would anyone find this solution? The reason why this is important, because of labor theory, is we want to reward people who can come up with non-obvious things, things that require the mind to reach new heights. Right? You design an iPad, you design an iPod, you design a click, you design a mouse. These are new things that people perhaps haven't seen before. It would not be obvious uh, in, in the past. Okay. Uh, the last element, which is the most technical, is called enablement. You have to be able to describe your invention in detail so someone else who's an expert in the field would understand it. This is where I mentioned the patent bar comes into play. If you have a background in engineering or hard science, you would be well suited to help do patent applications because you can actually understand the technical processes underlying your invention. This is a, this is a place where lawyers usually get in trouble and lawyers have to try and make stuff up. It's always funny when there's a patent case before the Supreme Court and the judges try and grapple things around. Uh, there was a case a year or two ago involving um, uh, uh, a certain type of a gene which was created whether it could be patented. And the justices had to think, of like, well, what happens if, you know, you put, like, a, like an, a plant in the ground and it grows and some other plant comes in and, and takes it over and they try all these crazy analogies. Fortunately, the patent office has engineers who can, who can talk about these things in, in sensible fashions. Okay. <coughs> Patents are good for 20 years, right? So it's not the life plus 70, it's 20 years. And after 20 years from filing, you have the generics that come in. So everyone knows, you know, after Viagra had its run, you had, you know, Levitra and Cialis, all these other knockoffs, right? Once you have the patent run out, you can have other companies come in and make generics. Yes? No, it's 20 years. You get your run. What what what? Sometimes they'll try to do is they'll make a new patent that's slightly different, and that would effectively extend it, which is often what's done. But you can't renew it. Questions? Okay. The last one that we'll cover for today is called a trademark. Okay. All right. What's a trademark? Oh, I need to have a can of soda in front of you. Ah. Look at the can. Do you see a little logo that says TM somewhere? Yeah, R. R, okay. Good. good. Where, where's the R located? Next to the logo, right? Okay. Trademarks, which are sometimes represented with an R or, or a little R in a circle. You've seen this in every bottle. 
these refer to protecting words, names, or symbols. Okay? Words, names, or symbols. Like Coca-Cola, right? Pepsi, Nike, M&M. Their logos with their words on it, like the, you know, the Coca-Cola with the script logo, that's their trademark. That's their registered mark. Distinguish this from copyright. Coca-Cola is not saying that um, Coca the word Coca-Cola is like a book or a literary work. They're protecting the actual script, the expression. The purpose of a trademark is to prevent confusion and to ensure that when someone sees that Coca-Cola logo, they know they're actually getting a can of Coca-Cola and not like some knockoff brand. Okay? These can be basically kept indefinitely. As long as you're using a trademark, you can get it. So Coca-Cola doesn't need to worry about someone taking their, their trademark in a couple decades. Okay? And there are three requirements for trademarks. Uh, the first is what's called distinctiveness. Distinctiveness means that it's used to distinguish one good from another. So if you have a can of Coke and a can of Pepsi and you look at the marks on them, you're going to know which is which, right? There's no ground for confusion. But if, say, for whatever reason, Pepsi decides to rip off Coke's logo and put the same script on their thing, you might be confused. Okay. But Coca-Cola is a very distinctive logo. The second one is what's called non-functionality. Okay. If something's functional, right, if it does something, that's something you should patent. The mark, the logo Coca-Cola, can't serve any purpose other than identification, right? It can't be used to express ideas of any sort. It's only used to identify that mark. Okay? And the third one is what's called first use in trade. Meaning you have to be the first to use this logo in commerce, right? So if Coca-Cola is the first one to use that logo in commerce, they're the first in trade. Yes, ma'am. Well, so so this does come up a little bit. So there's a case mentioned in your book called Qualtex versus Jacobson, um, and this involved I think they were paint swatches, and it was argued that the color of the paint was actually functional. Right? Because usually when you have the color in a can of soda, the color, you know, it's just to distinguish it. But in these cases, there were paint swatches. The color was actually significant because it was trying to convey what the paint would be. So in that case, because it was functional, it was not eligible for a trademark. So it does come up. Okay? Yeah. So those are the three main uh, things of trademark. I don't really have much more to say about this. Um, you, you might use it at some point in your career. So any, any questions on this? Okay, again, I'll be at the thing in 316 at 1220 if I learn more. I will see you all on Monday. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Monday, Monday. Yeah. Wednesday, Wednesday.